The, the floor is yours. I hope, did you hear the introduction that I made? I did not, unfortunately. I was off. Oh, he was off. Okay. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, I just said that we will all uh, talk for about 10 minutes to present right. our, uh, and you have a PowerPoint, and then we will uh, open the floor for discussion. And my colleague Stacy next to me uh, from South Africa, whom you haven't met, uh, who says hello, she will uh, moderate the chat uh, uh, box. Okay, super. Go ahead, Lloyd. Right, good. So, uh, my greetings to you all. What I'll try to do with this paper or presentation uh, will be to provide some kind of uh, overview of uh, the ways in which uh, Asian Studies Centers have emerged in Africa in the last, uh, let's say, decade. Uh, because I was involved intimately in some of the processes, what I do is provide some kind of insights regarding the, 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 the process by which we now have uh, set up in the University of Ghana an Asian Studies Center. Well, so um, I'm trying to get to the next slide, uh, which is not working. I don't know why. Uh, can anybody help? Okay, good. Now it's working. All right. So, uh, you know, it's important to provide a context regarding how it is that the Asian question took on a certain salience in the African context. Uh, I would say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, and, 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 and China in particular have been uh, in many ways interacting, especially in the last century. Um, but I think that as we got to the latter part of, of the last century, uh, taking the 90s, uh, uh, and getting into the, 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 the early decade of this century, the interactions more or less increased, uh, or if you like, deepened. And this was essentially because of China's rise. Um, and as you can see in the um, picture that I provide, uh, which I took from, from a cartoonist, we see clearly that this was a, an Asian country that had come into prominence. And that prominence would would redound, if you like, or have an impact on not just the world, but of course, so far as Africa was part of the world, Africa as well. Um, so essentially, on the continent, reflections emerged in terms of the broader question of how do we engage China uh, as it rises? Um, and, and, you know, these questions um, were even deepened the more as uh, the interactions took on uh, an institutional kind of uh, 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 color or coloration. Uh, so for example, between 2000 and 2018, uh, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation first was set up in the early 2000s. And then in, over the last 18 years, there have been seven of these uh, uh, fora where at the institutional level, China and Africa have been interacting increasingly, right? Now, linked to this, the Chinese will come up with what I call the China-Africa policy document, uh, which was first uh, 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 released in 2006 and then updated in, in 2015, right? So China's emergence, uh, you know, uh, in the 19... Late 1980s, of course, some put it in, in the in the late 70s, uh, meant that Africa and African uh, scholars and policymakers began to reflect on 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 on, on this uh, reality. But it was not just only China's rise; other Asian countries were also now engaging Africa far more than had been the case, you know, uh, uh, hundred years before or 60 years before. So for example, the Japanese had set up the Tokyo International Conference for African Development, TICAD, which in fact the Chinese in many ways borrowed from, right? Regular series of, of, of interactions. Um, the Koreans also came up with their fora, and then the, the Indians, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, so, and also uh, even Singapore, right? So you have all of these maelstrom, if you like, all of these interaction take, interactions taking place, right? Now, these interactions would raise both practical and ideational questions. Um, the practical questions were obviously, well, if you were dealing with the Chinese, there were cultural questions, there were linguistic questions, there were strategic questions, you know, and it became clear that if you looked at the African continent, there was a depth of understanding of, of these Asian countries. Um, and so the practical questions, as I already indicated, but these also had ideational overtones, right? Uh, in terms of, well, what do you make of, of, of the Chinese in terms of, you know, their, their, their view of the world, uh, uh, the ways in which they, they saw the world, the Koreans, uh, their geopolitics and all of that, right? So it is within this context that the Asian question came up and therefore how to handle this became uh, fundamentally an existential uh, challenge. Uh, so it is within this ferment that we need to place uh, the, the emergence of, 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 of Asian studies and, and, and Asian studies centers that more or less uh, uh, came with it. And as I indicate, uh, with, with this picture, you know, even recently with the, with, the, with the election of Joe Biden, the Americans themselves are grappling with this, this question. Um, and in this particular economist uh, whose uh, uh, cover I use, there's another article, in fact, that looks at, you know, China studies in, in the U.S., and, 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 and whether, you know, it is deepening or it is, it is or in fact, the, 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 the nature and the form that it is taking, you know. So clearly, not just Africa, but, but of course, uh, uh, across the world, how to deal with, with Asia, of course, with, with China as, as, as the anchor has become an issue. And, and Africa clearly was not going to be left out, right? Okay, good. So how was Africa then you know, going to deal with this question uh, of responding to the reality of these uh, uh, Asian and countries and the ways in which they were uh, uh, engaging if Africa at the level of diplomacy, at the level of the economy, uh, and many, many other, uh, many, many other areas, right? Of course, you know, clearly the key question was also in, in trying to respond to this. Uh, how do you more or less uh, uh, study uh, or, or come to understanding of, 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 these, uh, of these countries and of course of this region? Um, and as I argue in the paper uh, far more extensively, um, the key question became, you know, what kind of model uh, 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 if Asia should be studied at all uh, uh, formally, uh, at the level of especially our African academies, what kind of models should be should be utilized uh, to, to 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 provide us to provide the continent with a certain uh, uh, useful handle uh, uh, on 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 this emergent uh, uh, region? Um, of course, the U.S. one was the immediate uh, 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 attractive one, um, but of course. To look at the U.S. reality would mean, um, obviously, that you are looking at the history of how Asian studies itself emerged. Um, and so I argue that there have been three waves of, of, of how it is that, you know, looking at the world, uh, uh, or if you like, the West looking at the world regarding others uh, 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 had been more or less a... Uh, 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 approached, right? So Said gives us the, the classic, uh, uh, you know, uh, ways in which this had initially occurred, so that in his work, Oriental, Orientalism, we see the arguments that he makes, uh, you know, but Orientalism was basically a European 
more or less uh, 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 approach uh, that argued basically that you know the others, which included, of course, Africa and Asia, uh, were this static, uh, uh, you know, realities that could be studied and and understood uh, in ways that will allow you know Europeans to 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 more or less, uh, if you like. Uh, uh, engage the region in terms of, of 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 the ways in which they sought to dominate and control, right? But beyond that, the Orientalism reaches its limits, and and what replaced it, what I call the second wave, and you find it in the literature, was the emergence the emergence of area studies. Um, now, area studies was basically uh, an evolution in many ways of Orientalism. And um, what it sought to do was to allow especially uh, America to, to, to uh, get a handle on, on other areas of the world as it became a global hegemon. Uh, so within that context, Asian studies therefore emerged, right? So these uh, you know, uh, 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 ways of looking at the others, uh, especially with respect to Asian studies, uh, became in many ways the, the, the model that was going to more or less uh, 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 provide a template for, for you know, those of us in Africa who wanted to, 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 to begin to engage Asia. Uh, and this had been reinforced or, or would be reinforced because of, of course, the ways in which the world had become, if you like, uh, integrated, you know, uh, globalization, and, and in fact, neoliberalism, you know. So um, this was the challenge that we faced in Africa when we began to more or less uh, uh, look at the, the question of Asian studies, um, to more or less look at the, the Asia region uh, and, 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 and borrow, if you like, or norm the ways in which the, the, the Americans, especially in the latter reincarnation of the study of the others, had gone about it and more or less uh, uh, follow it. And I think Achille Mbembe makes it, makes it clear uh, in the way in which he, he argues that, you know, the African Academy had become westernized. Uh, uh, of course, this had been deepened because of, of the ways in which Africa had become neoliberalized, you know. So uh, the, the ways in which looking at Asian studies was going to be more or less uh, uh, approached was obviously uh, going to take uh, uh, the Western approach, you know, so uh, approach the, the, the leading, leading foundations in the, in the West, especially the U.S., uh, write proposals, uh, get funding, and all of that, you know. But I think that a, third wave, a fourth wave uh, emerged that sought to go beyond this stylized uh, thinking about how to deal with, 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 with Asian studies. Um, and I will argue that this approach necessarily sought to be decolonial. Um, the standard Western approach, in my view, was more or less one that um, was suffused with, with a certain hegemonic mindset. Um, of course, if you take the African region, uh, this does not map up you know, uh, uh, exactly. But at least this, this was going to be the outlook, uh, which meant that it was problematic. We needed to find another kind of approach regarding the way in which we, we looked at uh, Asian studies so that we'll move beyond power over, uh, you know, and, 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 and look rather at a more solidaristic, more engaging approach, uh, which I call power with in, in, in the more extensive paper that uh, I, I talk about. So, in a sense, this is how the new approach or the fourth wave, as I call it, uh, began to more or less take seats. Um, um, and, and in this slide, I, I, I raise the, the, the issue of the power, you know, with approach, which became more or less uh, the ways in which uh, we sought to go. Uh, now, how we got there, uh, I'll not bore you with this, this, this slide, but... Of course, as the, the thinkers indicate in this slide, um, the reality of the world meant that, you know, if you like, 
the dominant uh, 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 centers of power and the ways in which they approach things needed to be subverted. Uh, and of course, to do that, we have to still more or less engage with that space. Uh, and in, in engaging with that space, I argue that there were certain vulnerabilities that will allow us to, 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 to take advantage of that space and carve, especially in terms of Asia, Asian studies, a new kind of approach. So what were some of these uh, vulnerabilities that I think helped us as we try to, 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 to carve a new approach to Asian studies that was decolonial, that was fresh, that was uh, 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 rather visionary and, and less, uh, if you like, uh, uh, constrained by the old self-serving hegemonic uh, approaches, right? I think that some of the key things, and I expand that in my, in my longer article, um, one of the key things that helped was what I call the, the presence of counter hegemony supporting entities. These are personalities and uh, 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 organizations. Uh, and so, for example, I myself would come into contact with uh, the International Institute for Asian Studies at, at, at Leiden, um, out of which I would also come to, 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 to engage with foundations such as Melon. Now, these entities played a very crucial role for, for example, the first uh, meeting that we had in, in Zambia, where we laid out quite clearly the, the, the fundamental ideas that we wanted to shape this fourth wave of, of Asian studies, uh, or more to the point, Asian studies in Africa, right? Uh, I'll bore you with the details. You have them in my, in my, in my article. The other thing that played a key role is what I call serendipity. Uh, the Ghanaian scholar Atukwesin provides us with his, his take on serendipity. Uh, and by serendipity, I simply mean the processes beyond the control of, of agents that help them in the kind of goals that, that they seek to, to realize. You know? So I never knew uh, Webby Kalikiti, for example. I never knew uh, 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 you know, uh, Philippe Picam. I never knew the other colleagues that I've come to know now. But somehow, you know, we, 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 we got to know each other uh, in a very strange, you know, very uh, uh, seren serendipitous way, uh, which all helped in the ways in which we, we all joined forces to begin the work that we have done so far, right? The third leg of, of how I think we went about trying to build these centers uh, for Asian studies and deepen uh, collaborations on, on, on Asian research uh, from the African perspective was information technology. Um, for example, they got to me because they, uh, Philippe and, and Webby, when they began the processes, got to me because they had my email. Uh, so my the presence of my email, for example, helped to allow them to make contact uh, uh, with me. Um, of course, the internet had been created by the, the State Department, uh, sorry, the def Defense Department of Defense of the, of the US uh, for their own purposes. But here we are, we could use it to more or less, uh, you know, pursue the, the, the institutionalization of, of Asian studies, uh, which, which, which has become a reality, at least the, the, the emergent uh, signs are there, right? So more or less, I would say that these three modes have allowed us to begin a process of pursuing a, a fourth wave of, 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 if you like, in course, engaging the other and studying the other, that is solidaristic, that is uh, instrumental, but positively so, uh, that is again, not just instrumental, but it's about knowledge for its own sake. And, uh, and, and, and this knowledge in terms of looking at disciplines across uh, 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 all kinds of disciplinary, if you like, uh, uh, boundaries and, and, and spaces. Uh, so, I think that we have managed uh, thus far on the basis of understanding and mutual uh, 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 vision to, to more or less consolidate our, our strengths. And now, for example, we have 
the Center for Asian Studies, Studies at the University of Ghana. Um, uh, we've made a lot of strides th thus far. Uh, we have students who are doing research. Uh, we've had a series of conferences. Uh, I myself have just I have just published a book on 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 Ghana China relations, um, and 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 things are going on. Uh, the, the the Koreans want to fund uh, 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 are funding the massive uh, 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 infrastructure undertaking. Uh, we've managed at this point to almost uh, convince them uh, to 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 sinking you know quite a you know a substantial amount of of money which we are going to uh, uh, sign on uh, next year. So things are, are happening and and it is this power with approach that has more or less made this possible. We took a different path uh, 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 of the ways in which we wanted to study and engage, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, <clears throat> if you like, in course, others uh, than, than, than has been uh, the case uh, uh, in, in, in the literature, if you like. But of course, in doing all this, I like to end by saying that it's, it's, it's not, you know, all lovey-dovey. There are still problems that we we'll need to deal with going forward. Uh, and one of the two questions I think we, we have to think about is, as scholars and institutions from the North and South en engage, uh, even within the context of this power with approach, how does power still play out? Uh, it's a matter that we need to look at, you know, we, we need to really look at um, the, in terms of funding, in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, in terms of epistemology and all of that, you know, how does power play out? These are questions that still uh, uh, we we'll need to, to, to look at. Uh, in other words, simply because we have moved or we are trying to move beyond a certain frame of, of our approach, uh, that does not mean that questions of domination and control uh, uh, will not uh, uh, come up. And, and so, I think we need a conversation on, on that. Um, and so uh, I would say that uh, I, I think I overshot my time, but, but I'll end here. My article uh, is quite extensive in, in the arguments that I make. I make. And so uh, I'll say thank you all, and, and I'm, I'm open for questions as, as we go along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lloyd, for this uh, great first presentation. Uh, we will continue the presentation and at the end we will have uh, questions and discussions. Uh, so now I invite uh, Dr. Lailita Anhong from Kasset South University in Thailand uh, to present a paper, Rethinking Africa in Thailand and Beyond. Lailita. Uh, um, I didn't expect to, you know, to be presenting a, a really serious paper here. Um, I, I didn't actually prepare, uh, but okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna talk you through um, the paper and what we have done so far. Um, it's really nice to see you all once again, but it's a bit weird to be here and you guys are, are all there. So hello to you all um, across Europe, Asia and Africa. Um, I'm from Gusesat University in Bangkok, Thailand, and we had quite a memorable uh, moment earlier this year with our colleagues from Africa. Um, some of you have visited us um, earlier this year, and after you visit, after you visit, boom, uh, shit just happens. <laughs> and um, yeah, since March or April, um, we can't go anywhere again. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit nostalgic to be here because um, some of you guys who we had seen in March uh, are also here with us at this panel. Um, I enjoyed uh, Loy's presentation very much, um, but for us here in Thailand, uh, African studies, Asian and African studies as a whole, it's still um, at a very, very beginning. Um, I'm just going to talk you through what we have done during the last one year or so, or probably six months, five months, six months, um, since we met 
Uh, so Philippe, uh, Webby, Kojo, um, and some other friends and colleagues, um, we had met uh, in Bangkok in February or March this year um, to discuss what would be the direction for um, the CESA University um, African Asia, Africa Asia Center. But, you know, this year has been very difficult for everyone and things seem to go quite slowly. Um, you know, not, not just for us, but for everyone around the world as well. Um, right now, we're still at the, at the very beginning to establish our um, Africa Asia Center. But uh, we now have a concrete list of committee members, uh, both from our faculty. Uh, I'm from the Faculty of Social Sciences and from um, our university. So basically, the president of the university has recognized um, our plan, uh, our blueprint, what we are trying to do and what we aim uh, for the next you know, couple of years or five years. Um, so far, we already have a, have a committee, but unfortunately, um, the first thing I, I have to tell you is that um, my faculty will establish um, a big center, which I believe is called um, the Social Sciences Center for Sustainable Development or something, which I don't agree on everything, but okay, it's, it's going to happen. So our center, the Africa Asia um, Center, it can't really be a center anymore. So what I tried to propose was um, I wanted to stick with the center because it sounds more real and it sounds more sustainable in a way. Um, but my dean said that we can just move on with whatever name it is and then if it's really successful, if it produces something concrete, then we might have a real center in, in the future. You never know. So right now, um, the new name for this is uh, Gasesa University or KU Africa Asia Program. Um, you know, I was thinking about this word program because because of this year's um, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize um, winner the World Food Program. So um, I thought, okay, program is fine. Um, so what we're going to do, the plan for next year is um, we are going to have a sort of a, a podcast and a YouTube uh, program. Um, we, have, we have already done um, at least one this year on, um, on, a, on, a, on a talk series, but it's, it's a broad theme. Um, the, the, the theme that we had put was like six months ago or, you know, a year ago. So we put a broad theme on, you know, sustainable development, Africa, Asia and stuff. And um, a couple of months ago, we had invited our friend and colleague Rita from uh, Singapore um, to give a talk online on Zoom. And it was it was quite impressive. And everyone, uh, by the way, if Rita is there, just wanted to say that everyone at my faculty really appreciated her um, her presence and her talk. Um, it it was nice, and she was talking about um, you know urbanization, how urban studies can be understood um, through the perspectives of Asia and Africa, and. Yeah, it, it was quite nice. And at the end of the day, I believe that there there must have been, you know, at least 400 or 500 re views now um, on both YouTube and, and Facebook channels. So that was a start. Um, at the beginning of next year, we will be having a series of talk. But because of my faculty's connection and because of you know the the nature of african studies if you like in thailand which is mostly based on um international relations because we now have like seven only seven or eight um is there is there any comment 
Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the talk series will be, um, be it, it will begin with international, international relations. Um, Thailand doesn't really have, you know, quite a number of, um, embassies in Africa yet, but they do have plans in the future. I'm not sure how, how soon it will be, but, uh, I've been informed by some former embassy, uh, former ambassadors to Africa that um, there are always plans to have more embassies in Africa. Uh, I know a lot of our colleagues have complained to me directly that the way in which the Thai government and Thai embassies in Africa have dealt with um, visa application and things, um, it's crazy and it's unreal. But, you know, even with me as a Thai citizen, I have to deal with this kind of crazy Thai bureaucracy all the time as well. So, you know, you guys are not alone. Um, yeah, so the first thing that we will do, um, probably in, in January, uh, and February is we're going to have a talk online, uh, on Zoom again. Um, no, it's not exactly on Zoom because we already started to go to the university. My university started already last week and, um, we can now invite people uh, to our faculty and we can record the videos uh, yeah mostly in Thai but if we have time and we have enough resources we will make subtitles and it will be broadcasted on YouTube and anyone uh, around the world can watch it um, yeah the first person that will come to give a talk and um, yeah we will we will interview I, I believe it's him um, is a former Chasse de Fer, uh, most likely in, in, um, in Mozambique. Yeah. So that's the first person that my colleague had suggested. But my goal for the next speaker, I know it's a bit boring because like I said before, when Thai people understand Africa, they understand in terms of diplomacy, you know, they, they, they don't quite understand Africa in terms of um, trade and commerce and economy just yet. Um, I must say that the perception of Thai people or Thailand in general on Africa is very minimal. So what um, our program has been trying to do um, at, at this very beginning is to make the general public um, realize that Africa really exists and it's really exciting and you should go to Africa sometimes, you know, um, instead of visiting Japan, instead of visiting, um, you know, all, all these countries all the time. So, um, yeah, the, the first one or two um, speakers for our talk series on Asia and Africa will be um, diplomats. But my, my goal is I, I really want to invite um, a former ambassador, a former Thai ambassador to uh, Maputo in Mozambique uh, to be with us, most likely in March, because he is now a very famous um, person on a political scene because he is now retired. He's now 60 years old. Um, he's back to Thailand and he has become very famous because of his political stance. You know, now politics in internal politics, uh, domestic politics in Thailand is very, very hot. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if you have followed this at all, but um, things have become um, very quickly developed. Like, um, for example, just a few months ago, we couldn't really talk about the monarchy. But right now, every single person is talking about the monarchy, of, of course, in a bad way. You know, um, the less majesty law is still intact and they're raising this up once again. But right now, everyone just wants to talk about it. Everyone is now criticizing um, the king's budget, the, the fact that the king spent, you know, most of his time in Germany and all that. Um, so, you know, the political landscape in Thailand right now is changing. And, you know, before I forget raising this topic, I think that before the Thai government realizes the potential of Africa, um, we really need a democratic government because under this 
um, this regime, which is utterly incompetent in every aspect that you can imagine. <laughs> um, I don't think that they, they realize the, the potential and importance of Africa. They don't really want to know. Um, the work, the diplomatic work on Africa has been kept very, very, very minimal. And, um, you know, there have been articles written by ex-diplomats, ex-judge um, d'affaires, ex-this and that on Africa. Um, like Africa is nice. Africa is adventurous. Africa is great. You know, Africa doesn't just have, like, Africa is, is interesting. Let's put it that way. But um, you know, the readers and people who are really interested on Africa, um, it's still not a lot. So what our program is trying to do is to gradually build, I don't know if you know this word, but, you know, because we um, we consume a lot of Korean pop here in Thailand. So we have this term called fandom, F-A-N-D-O-M, and it means um, in the future, if we do it right, you know, if we do it in a in a good way, uh, we will have some followers, and they will they will naturally start to be interested in anything Africa. And um, after this, uh, I'd like to expand the interest on on Africa on something something else, something broader much broader than um, international relations and diplomacy. Um, we have planned uh, with our program uh, that in July we are going to have an African Cultural Week, um, but we are still thinking when, uh, when exactly or where um, this event will be held. Um, I propose that if we really want to go big, if we want to be famous and every, everybody knows us, um, right there. We need to organize this um, at, for example, uh, Goethe Institute or Alliance Francaise in Bangkok. But um, yeah, we yeah we have discussed about this before, but um, I will keep you informed what's going on. Um, so the next topic that I, I like to talk about um yeah some somebody has whispered to me that um i need to talk about the importance of a southeast asian sorry southeast asia africa dialogue um platform um loy has pointed out before with the rise of china um that we we now in southeast asia and anywhere in the world we, we are now talking about china everyone is so excited what china is now doing um uh, especially here in southeast asia if you go to Laos, if you go to cambodia um or even myanmar nearby um everyone is so concerned about about the you know the emergence of china as the as the sole um big power global power and um, because of china's role in africa um, I think uh, countries around the world, or especially in Southeast Asia, we have to pay more attention um, to to Africa as well. Um, I think here in Thailand, some people have have talked about this, uh, you know, one belt, one road, this very uh, ambitious plan of China, and why we have to understand Africa more. Um, I, I realized that. Um, actually, at the foreign, minist foreign affairs minist ministry of Thailand, they have quite um, a lot of knowledge on this. Um, they have done quite a lot. But um, what I what I've been trying to do is I want the Thai public to to know more about this as well. Um, I I I I think that we we need to you know to establish a link between um, the Thai bureaucracy the you know, ministries, not just the foreign affairs ministry, um, but some other ministries who have um, who have done something on Africa as well. Probably the Ministry of Commerce, and we have to establish this um, this idea that Africa is is not just important, but we need we need to do something about it. And uh, we have no history book on Africa yet. Um, I think Thai people, most of us know Africa um, in terms of history from um, the books, the, the world's famous book, Sapiens. But um, that's that's about it. Um, 
yeah, um, like I said before, I'm not really here to be, you know, an exciting speaker because our work at our university has just begun. Um, maybe um, when it comes back to me um, to the next round, I can probably uh, reflect on my thoughts later. But for now, um, I think I'll, I'll open the floor for, for the rest of you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nalita. Uh, we will certainly have uh, more to discuss because uh, uh, I, as one of the persons who you invited in uh, February at your institute at Casetza, I think we, uh, uh, together with colleagues like Kojo or, or Abdu, uh, 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 Webby and, uh, and Rita, etc., we really uh, very much discuss also about uh, that Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, dimension as a truly south-south uh, 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 because when we say Asia uh, can we con consider uh, countries like China or Japan as as south you know for instance okay but that that's for uh, later we can continue the discussion now I, I hope uh, Matthew a colleague from uh, uh, Dar es Salaam Matthew are you there okay there's some problem here uh, yeah, Matthew is not here from uh, University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, I don't know, he may have some uh, technical problem. Uh, so I will ask our colleague Rohit, Rohit Negi from uh, Delhi. Uh, it's up, up, I saw it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rohit, if you could present your, uh, make your presentation about Ambedkar University. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, thanks to other colleagues. Uh, at IAS and elsewhere, uh, great to connect, no matter what what means we choose to do so. Um, so basically, I'll keep it short. Try to keep it short. And uh, actually, from Lloyd's uh, and Lalita's uh, presentations that have gone already, one can see that a lot of the questions that we are confronting or trying to find responses to are are similar. Uh, they are about reimagining the academy broadly speaking because you know when we as we have joined as we've studied as we've sort of been employed at these institutions we have been handed uh, the institutions they have not emerged out of any sustained thinking on the part of uh, a new generation of of uh, of academics um and and the second within this larger reimagination uh, the question is how do we know the world how do we approach the world uh, beyond, uh, again, received uh, frames of, of seeing uh, and the ones that uh, already Lloyd talked about very uh, powerfully around area studies and so on. So that's broadly the, the, the context that we are talking about. And uh, my brief intervention today is, is, is about uh, uh, one intervention from a social science and humanities institution located in Delhi, uh, in India. Uh, we are, uh, uh, so basically I'm talking about Ambedkar University, which is a relatively small institution. We are only about 3,500 students at the moment, uh, 150 faculty. So we are not going to change the entire uh, scenario of higher education in India anytime soon, given the population of over a billion. Uh, but at the same time through uh, innovating through thinking creatively, through experimenting. Perhaps uh, our idea is to uh, be a kind of, a, kind of a, 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 an experiment that others can perhaps uh, uh, consider, right, if, if things go well. Uh, if you could just change the slides, please, to the third one. Uh, or if I have already that. OK, yeah, thank you. I think I can do that now from now on. So in that context, uh, in our institution, you know, uh, it's a place where uh, two or three broad, with two or three broad ideas, uh, frames in terms of uh, 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 the institutional agenda. One is social justice, second is environmental sustainability, 
uh, and and third being uh, community engagement engagement with the world outside so if those are our, are our sort of founding mandate and with the kinds of logic concerns that i opened with uh, these are the questions that we have been uh, thinking through uh, and thinking with over the last decade almost the de last decade so how do we study regions after the cold war uh, and with the critiques uh, that we have already uh, fairly uh, well entrenched in academia but 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 with you know it's one thing to to be critical sitting in the university of chicago and it's a, it's another thing to actually try to create new institutions with with some of these ideas um and if we have to promote a study of africa like i'm personally invested in but uh, so are many others uh should it be in the terms that again are inherited uh, is africa for instance just out there waiting to be explored as a discrete unit uh does it even make sense as a, as a, as a unit beyond uh, the continental and geopolitical frames that we have again inherited uh and if we are to study the world or approach the world differently uh what disciplinary frames do we do this from and then finally uh if we have certain principles that we can agree on then how do we translate them into concrete programs curriculum pedagogies so obviously uh these are very complex questions very 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 important questions also as far as we see them from from delhi uh and uh, and we've been trying to uh, uh think with these so broadly when we uh, uh around 3 or 4 years ago when we started to give shape to some of our institutions around the study of the world we uh, collectively settled or at least uh, uh, provisionally settled on a few principles that would for us guide uh, our programs and our courses on 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 the world on the globe uh one we were very interested in not taking the continental uh framing or imagination of the world as given so uh, it was about unsettling some of the mappings that have uh, that are taken for granted and are sort of that are out there that have become common sense and to do that and to unsettle those uh, very important or interesting way is to actually uh, uh, build through networks through connections right build a different conception of the world through through history and also ongoing uh, Uh, connections and networks that 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 form uh, as as a result of many kinds of interactions. So a focus on connections and moving beyond some of these uh, ways through which the world is imagined, and therefore instead of area studies organized through continents or through subcontinents and so on, uh, we are thinking of centers of globality. Uh, certain world, certain regions, certain spaces or networks even uh, through which we can understand. uh how the how how the global has, has been constructed uh, earlier and how it's been given shape uh, as we as we go forward and finally we are very very strongly uh, uh we have a very strong belief in in the values of interdisciplinary uh, ways of knowing rather than uh, one or the other uh we want to bring or 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 arrive at a terminology vocabularies and questions that that bring in rather than uh uh, uh police out uh, many disciplines uh, and uh, in particular also uh, ecological thinking as a way to 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 bring these different disciplines together so uh, so these were some principles and and, uh, and basically two kinds of ways in which we have formed our version of uh, programs and and courses in in what we call global studies um so we have basically can come about these are the themes that uh, we have organized our 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 unit around uh, there are themes of rather than economy and economics uh, our entry point is inequality and inequality obviously is economic but it's also a social phenomenon it is a geographical phenomenon it is an anthropological phenomenon uh, and therefore it allows for us, for us to consider the question of why is it that uh, there is this tremendous this inequality at all scales around the world uh, not just the global but also the regional the, the national and so on second a movement mobility uh, history of ideas and movement of ideas and 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 formation of, of 
of identities and solidarities around around number of things. So uh, this this unit sort of allows us to then again bring in uh, anthropological, historical, and and many other questions together. Uh, as does the state and democracy, which is about the dynamic or the dialectic of power and resistance over the long history. Right, so it's not just talking about the nation state or the modern state, but it's about uh, a long-term dynamic in power and, and resistance. Uh, and finally, global environmental change, as as I already mentioned, uh, uh, you know, in history, for instance, even ancient history has now started, or not not just started, but uh, now uh, it's been a couple of decades already, but has taken the environmental, the ecological question far more seriously than it earlier really used to, and certainly that's true of many other disciplines. Uh, but going forward, these concerns are becoming ever more important, and therefore uh, uh, they have to be part of a reimagining of of the global. Uh, in terms of institutional structures uh, in higher education. Uh, but more importantly, uh, as I flagged earlier, uh, we were interested in unsettling the map and, and having different points of entry into the globe, into the global. Uh, and so, um, and, and especially with principle that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, to be aware of where we are looking at the world from, uh, to look at connections, but also to bring in the maritime rather than just the territorial and the environmental, ecological rather than only the geopolitical or the cultural. Uh, and with these things in mind, I was just to give you a sense of some examples of uh, uh, the, 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 the two that we have already built and the two that we are working on right now in terms of uh, expertise, courses, student projects and all of that. Uh, the one, one is Himalayas and Trans Himalayas. Uh, it allows us to uh, uh, bring in, you know, areas around the ancient Silk Route, uh, Central Asia, Tibet, uh, parts of the Himalayas, and then beyond to China, uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. So it's a center of globality for us. It is something that goes back uh, centuries and millennia, but it remains uh, a deeply important region, world region even today, environmentally, politically, culturally, and so on. And uh, and second uh, is the Indian Ocean. I know there's a lot of work already happening around it. Leiden as a center, uh, and and so uh, we also think about or thought about uh, building our own uh, uh, one of the centers of globality as the Indian Ocean, which again connects not only East Africa with the Gulf and and Western India and so on, uh, but also really uh, changes the perspective uh, in terms of how we look at the world and brings island countries like. Uh, Sri Lanka and Madagascar into the center of, of, of the world rather than being at the margins of some territorial uh, continents in, in, in the usual uh, framings. Uh, and the two others that we are working on, which is more, which are more experimental at the moment, one uh, connecting to the Americas through uh, the Pacific and, you know, so so bringing also a comparative sense with the Indian Ocean, but, but building on uh, and, and extending outwards to the Americas through the Pacific Ocean. Once more, you, you realize here that, that many of the islands uh, become uh, central players or central participants in, in a way if knowledge is or, or, or teaching and learning education is organized uh, around different regions, right? Uh, and, and also environmental concerns uh, are highlighted very strongly when we start to look at the world through this kind of maps, uh, where, uh, you know, so concerns that surround, you know, for instance, Fiji, uh, where uh, uh, sea level rise and uh, result, resulting from global warming is a major issue, or even plate tectonics that connect South America to some of the islands uh, in the in the Pacific, and that have led to you know local knowledges, construction practices, urbanization, and so on in so many parts of the world, uh, and and those kinds of questions to be brought into the into the fore, forefront. And finally, uh, the fourth that we are experimenting with. Uh, is is actually even more uh, dispersed. It's not even a world region that I can point to on a map. It's it's the urban region, the urban region as a center of globality, uh, because not only are there similar phenomena, uh, but of course differentiated conceptually, but also the way they are connected in 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 making uh, of the world. So, for instance, in the map uh, on the top, it's the Central African Copper Belt area. 
which extends, uh, uh, which basically shared between Zambia and, and DRC, uh, and which because of copper mining across the last uh, uh, century and a half, uh, has led to a certain particular kind of uh, settlement pattern, towns, very, you know, prominent mining towns, Lubumbashi uh, or, or Kitwe and so on. Uh, and the thing is, it's, it's directly connected, however, to what we have seen in the Pearl River Delta, which is the other image on, the, on, you know, on this slide, uh, which is another urban region and which has these massive populations, the massive urbanization that happens across 30 to 40 years. Uh, of course, Hong Kong is older, but then uh, Shenzhen and the uh, densification and expansion of uh, Guangzhou even. So these two urban regions, you know, tell us something about the way uh, the world is urbanizing, the way uh, it's uh, impinging and imbricating uh, ecologies in its wake, uh, but also uh, the, the the connectedness that copper from from the copper belt actually is responsible or is goes into the making of of urban regions like the Pearl River Delta, uh, and and then the demand from there then increases the price of copper, and through that uh, the money reaches uh, countries like Australia and Canada, which have huge, huge investments in, in copper mining. Um, so these kinds of uh, connections again, these are not. Uh, given these are not even intuitive, but they allow uh, or they 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 sort of uh, they emerge once we start to look at the world differently uh, through network. Uh, situated historical uh, lens. Um, and so these are just some uh, insights from the kind of thinking we have been doing. Of course, there are many, many challenges. There are challenges about uh, policing. I think one big challenge is about resources uh, and uh, making sure that some uh, our students also have the kind of chances or possibilities of connecting with the world that students, let's say, of a similar program in, in the Northern Academy would have. There are challenges related to disciplinary frames uh, and particularly, I don't want to diss any particular discipline, but uh, but definitely I'm dissing economics here. Uh, and, uh, and there are other challenges related to institutional uh, 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 bureaucracies and so on, but these are all things that we can work around and we can work uh, work through. Uh, more importantly, uh, I believe is 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 whether how we learn from each other in terms of uh, developing a new way to to look at the world, to know the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, uh, that's for this very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, just want to say that our colleague uh, Matthew Senga from uh, uh, Dar es Salaam uh, has been uh, is, is caught in traffic, so he told me to uh, mention uh, summarize his paper, which I will do uh, later. Uh, so, uh, but now I would like to ask uh, our colleague um, Abdul Sek, Abdul Rahman Sek from uh, University Gaston Berger, if he can uh, make his presentation. Abdul. There, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Okay, great. great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. And also, I will thank uh, the International Institute for Asian Studies so to get me into that conversations and uh, also mostly to uh, get me that pleasure to meet again with all these uh, dearest colleagues and, uh, and friends I see there. So uh, the purpose of my topics is about uh, something I have called here uh, creating an ASEAN study center in Francophone Africa, uh, like a principal title. But the most important here for me is the necessity to hear about what is kind of opportunities to go this way and also the nature of the obstacle we have faced this and i will talk about that uh, from two kind of uh, field of experiences the first one is all my work about african diaspora and uh, the second one will be uh, of course uh, the encountering or the my meeting with uh, International Institute of Asian Studies and uh, all the very nice people I have met through his uh, networks and all the work we have done together. Uh, and I will bring your attention to accompany me to, to think 
about uh, some couple of points I'm now gonna start to share. First of all, uh, the first of these questions I got was about the title of this big program, uh, Africa Knows Conference. And I want to, uh, to share what happened to me first time I saw this. I said, I said to myself, how come science needs to be recalled? And what make it so audible or maybe so strange? That was a very big question for me. And I started to think that uh, we definitely need to precise from which positionalities and from which context, from which stakes we are talking about these questions. Because that's not come immediately or spontaneously on mind to say like, for example, Asia knows or United States knows or Europe knows, Netherlands knows, those kind of things. But why this question is possible about Africa is something struck to me and I would like to, uh, to insist about uh, 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 yeah, these positionalities and contexts and say. And to answer that question, the secondary questions, I frame another one question, who is answering this, the, that questions? And I was, uh, from that point, thinking about something I never thought about, really, that if I take my personal case, just 30 more years, and I would have been born under a colonial regime. Of course, then I avoid this colonial regime, but instead I was born in a new colonial, in a, in, in new coloniality and grew up under the blows of neoliberalism. And that is very important. Uh, uh, what allowed this kind of questions is all about context and also about generation, but I will come later uh, on that point. So from where I'm standing and I'm talking and I'm trying to think with you about these questions, this context is, can be characterized by at least three, three points. The first one is the land I am in, I, I grew up, is a land of military maneuver and economic extractivism on behalf of foreign power. It's very important. Lloyd, you have mentioned it a little about that when you showed the American guys and Chinese guys trying to, uh, to grab uh, you know, uh, the, the, the telecommand. So, and Africa is particularly the, the land of uh, extractivism and military maneuver on behalf of foreign powers. The second one characteristic is about a violent political regimes that drives intellectual and political alternative underground systematically or quite systematically. And the third one is, my place is a land of humanitarian missions and intervention. And it's just enough. And because that's enough, I want to quote Franz Fanon's very important thought here. Each generation must, in relative opacity, find its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And the way that we have tried to be uh, on the same page with these quotations I mentioned, that's what I want to, to talk about in two, two points. Uh, and these two points are related to what I called my experience through my work with the African diaspora and uh, my uh, uh, meetings with EIS. So then, first of all, what I have learned from this work with diasporas and I think that today, if you really want to build a new way, as Lalita, for example, has mentioned in some aspect in her talk, 
a new way to reframe the way that we are talking about Africa and Asia and to not necessarily uh, uh, amplify the fear that today Europe has or USA has about China's and his role all around the world. We do need to, to see what is sweetest within these complaints and what is really against our strategic interests. I think that's a very big question we definitely need to have here. We don't have to be a simple, uh, a simple uh, uh, tools or space to amplify uh, any some of the uh, uh, readings of the international geopolitics. But about to be to get back to that diaspora's issues, I do think that we have until today. A one category of people we are not really bringing into the conversations and they are what Africa and Asia have as diaspora in the heart of Europe and in the heart of the of United States these people I think have their place to and a very important place and role to play uh, uh, if you really want to uh, get on a critical and decolonial track this dialogue between Africa and, and, and Asia uh, connections. So uh, now uh, about uh, international Asian studies, I want to say just something very important. In 2016, when I got the first info invitation to join the networks, that invitation came along a very important work we were at that time doing uh, with some colleagues uh, in my universities. And we were trying to anchor, to anchor the decolonial turning point in the African academic space. We were also trying to reinvigorate rating the critical Pan-African ideal and also to build, try to build a bridge between the continent, uh, the Asian continent. And then suddenly we got EIS and said, okay, that's a big change. So we try to see, okay, what we are now doing to change the, the logic and the narrative to make understand Northern partner that if you really want be in partnership with us, we need that you, you need to, to de-learn the way that you are uh, uh, dealing with things usually. Because right now we need to co-construct. We want a co-constructing agenda, you know. So then we, we put on the table of our discussions the necessity for us to go to the mutually strategic and non conjunctural agenda. And that was the creation in West African Francophone era, a center for Asian studies. And a lot of things happens and not happens at the same time. And that's what I wanted to, 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 to reach now, what I call there the obstacle. I think the first obstacle, and we need to be honest and clear about that, is not the culture of work of the international cooperation. The first obstacle, our own first handicap is our own institutions, our own national uh, African institutions. Yes, they will give you principle support in principle, but that support rarely take a kind of decisive impact. And then you are never really able to discuss and to, and, 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 and to really uh, 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 be at the same level of capacity to, dis to navigate within the international opportunity and also con constraints. And that is very important. 
And what I call here international constraints and also opportunity, that's, yeah, of course, there has been circulating a lot of interesting farms around the world. A lot of interesting farms uh, get, get out of the ground uh, 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 and go to support a very interesting initiative. But also there is kind of culture in these uh, encountering that always remains like uh, the, the enlistment or the un enrollment of the thousands partner. And I think we have here something of, like a problem we need to deal with, how to move out of the classical culture of part partnership with Africa. This culture is something we need to reconsider. And even when we are talking about uh, South South, of course, it's very ideal and it's very interesting. But even South South, in terms of Asia, Africa, again, duplicate the same problem we can, we can meet when comes the time that we are talking or trying to partnership with no funds, no funds uh, institutions in, in, in general. So I want to say that in order to not monopolize the, the, the mic, that uh, what we, what, how, the way that we are seeing what could be kind of renewal of uh, studying Africa in Asia or studying Asia in Africa or studying the African-Asia connections. Lloyd, again, here, here also, I do hear what you have said about this probable model that could be uh, born in Africa. But I want to say that until now, all we have on the tables is about, you know, uh, uh, unrolling the academic space, the classical academic space uh, in the way that they are just kind of pathfinders toward a model of neoliberal connection uh, of, uh, between Africa and, and Asia. That's what we have. We don't have something else. Uh, uh, and I wanted to, to, to just make it uh, uh, audible also for our discussions. Uh, and uh, maybe also to say that uh, how we can go and forward onto this. I think it's very important in Africa to try to our responsibilities. And I think our responsibility is to create space that are able to do without international cooperation. But let me tell something very important. The most important is that even, even though it's very important to be able to capacitize ourselves to be able to do without international cooperation, nevertheless, we must be very willing to engage in, with, in dialogue with these international cooperations in order to build a better, fairer, and more balanced world in which to share. I think that is something very important. And current, currently, the things we are trying, or the space we are trying, to, we are creating to try to do that, is something. For example, right now we have, uh, as a, we, we have something we call group debut adduction critic Africa, in which you will gonna find African diaspora and also Asian colleagues. And I think, yeah, that's something also I wanted to to signal in my purpose, and uh, maybe if someone also have some question, I could tell more. So thank you, Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdul, uh, for opening uh, uh, much in a, to opening the, the term of the debate in a, in a, in a very, uh, I think, uh, exciting and, and challenging way. Um, I think we will have this is, this is a lot of food for discussions uh, later on. Um, okay, now we have a 
very concrete problem is that our colleague Matthew Sanger is still not available, but he asked me to, sh in, in a few sentences, to, to somehow summarize uh, his paper. So I'm going to do that. Matthew Sanger from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Um, uh, he was the host of the second Africa Asia uh, a New Access of Knowledge conference in 2008. Uh, uh, 2018, sorry, uh, um, and many of us participated in, in this event. Uh, uh, what uh, Matthew wanted to uh, stress was the establishment of a, uh, an Africa-Asia research platform within his university, which uh, brings different uh, segments, departments, disciplines, and, and groups of people uh, uh, um, uh, of the uh, of uh, UDSM is university, which has six campuses, um, uh, to engage in a multi-level uh, 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 framework co uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, partners uh, uh, from Asia and, of course, from other parts of. Uh, oh, Matthew is Matthew now seems to be live. Matthew. Okay. Matthew? Ah, Matthew. Mike is out. Your mic is out, Mike. He's in a car. <laughs> no, he's, he's in a car. Okay, Matthew is in a car. I don't know if we will manage to... Uh... Shall we break it for 15 minutes? Then? No, no. I, okay, well, I will uh, continue and then if, if Matthew comes on board, uh, that will be great. Uh, but um, the point in, in Matthew's paper was, first of all, to very much yes, uh, to ascertain the importance of, uh, of history and the fact that uh, uh, in Tanzania especially, uh, 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 his colleagues and himself are very much mindful of the uh, critical importance played by uh, China in, in helping uh, develop uh, a, a non-Western driven agenda, academic intellectual agenda in, 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 uh, in, in his region in Africa. And though of course we are critical of, of often of China and, and its, uh, uh, and, and, and its uh, propension to, to, uh, to repeat uh, maybe a hegemonic model that already exists somehow with Western players, um, the point made by Matthew was that his university and a lot of the people in, in, uh, in Tanzania, in East Africa, uh, benefited from that new uh, axis of, of collaboration that started right during the time of, uh, uh, of, of the struggle for independence of the different countries of Africa. So that's a very important point. And, and out, out of it, uh, UDSM, uh, in Tanzania became one of the beacon of uh, a, a new African intellectual uh, model of, of, uh, 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 of uh, intellectual inquiry and, 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 uh, uh, and, and independent uh, uh, um, uh, um, economic, social, cultural, political development. Uh, um, and, and this is within this framework uh, and, and the, uh, the inspiration of the Bandung Conference of 1955, that his university has constantly tried to uh, maintain uh, an, uh, an Asian outlook. And, and lately, uh, um, this has materialized with this Africa Asia research platform, and, uh, and which took a concrete um, uh, turn uh, after the Africa Asia conference in 2018, which UDSM uh, uh, hosted. So, um, well, that, I, I cannot go further than that, and I hope Ma uh, Matthew at some point can join and can contribute. I just wanted to give this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, short uh, uh, um, um, summary. Also, uh, I think before uh, the, 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 the other paper was basically, it's the paper uh, put together by the IS team. Um, uh, so um, uh, it's a bit, uh, so I, I think we should try to be brief. 
Uh, I say we because it's uh, myself together with my colleagues, uh, Arti Colra and, um, and Paul Van Vell. Um, so uh, I can start by saying that IAS uh, is located in the north, uh, but as uh, uh, Abdul mentioned in, in uh, his paper, in many ways IAS is itself a marginal institution in the, I think, in the economy of institutional knowledge production in, in, in Europe and in, in the north in, or in the west in general. And um, in this, this marginality was uh, instituted from the beginning by creating an institute that was called International Institute and by uh, crying in the 90s when it was established by, um, by recognizing that it was no longer possible to per perpetuate the area studies model uh, with, in which we have uh, local experts of, on other parts of the world. Uh, and, and that, uh, of course, under, underlined uh, a hierarchy that was no longer uh, viable and necessary and, 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 and desirable. And that's just in the context of the end of the Cold War. And the founders of IAS managed to, uh, to um, uh, convince uh, the, uh, the government, the Ministry of Education in, in the Netherlands, that there was a need for a, an open space for an institute that could work as a kind of a clearinghouse, as a kind of facilitator, and that all its activities should be uh, uh, based on collaboration and, and, and not on a one-sided development of, of activities and projects and, and agenda. So it has done that by opening a number of open platforms like uh, the ICAS conference series and by extension and extension of ICAS were these uh, Africa Asia uh, platforms in which IS is basically lending its logistical capacities uh, without trying to control the agenda. Uh, it is doing that also or, uh, uh, through its uh, newsletter, which is a, a really open platform on the state of knowledge in relation to Asia with Asian partners. And it is uh, doing, uh, it has recently for the last few years doing that by trying to um, experiment on a new platform uh, to look for a concrete uh, uh, um, bottom-up, uh, embedded, localized form of knowledge production and ed education pedagogical model uh, uh, that will take into uh, uh, reclaim the local knowledge uh, in different parts of Asia, Africa, and elsewhere, uh, and to put them in conversation. And that's the Humanities Across Borders program, uh, uh, which very much links partners and, and institutions from Africa and Asia. So that's what uh, 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 Arti is, uh, I would like um, Arti maybe to, to introduce now, to talk about the importance of the humanities across borders and, and its Africa-Asia uh, uh, dynamic. Arti? Hi, hello everyone. So lovely to have uh, everybody here together. Um, thank you, Philippe. Uh, um, and thank you everyone at IAS for organizing this. Uh, sorry for the background. I don't want you to see any Hindu stuff either, but okay, you see what it, whatever there is. Um, yeah, um, so talking about humanities across borders, most of you already know about it. So, uh, but at the same time, I would like to suggest uh, in the context of this Asia Africa axis of knowledge, um, what we're trying to do here in this program, and uh, we have another five years to do so, we've already spent four years, as Abdu already mentioned, um, that we are trying to come up with a decolonial pedagogical model. So it's not just about decolonizing knowledge, it's also about decolonizing the way we receive this knowledge, use this knowledge, and also transmit this knowledge. So I think, um, uh, what's important uh, in this program and what we are trying to do, what we have done already through the conversations we've had with each other in the last four years, 
um, uh, many of our co colleagues, uh, we, we, we tried in our own thinking to break free from the borders of the mind, not just the borders of disciplines, geographies, language, culture, and so on, and nations, of course. But uh, in our own minds as, 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 uh, as scholars, we've had in the last four years to really break through this idea that we, uh, that we have to be denational, that there is a way of being, uh, as, um, uh, as uh, Rohit mentioned, also decontinental. Uh, how can we do that? And um, so we have a very simple uh, approach where we say that, OK, um, th firstly, there is a collaborative network. This collaborative network works in a, uh, we have at the moment, we have 20 uh, institutions and their civil society partners uh, across Asia, Africa, Europe, and North and Central America. So already there is a, a kind of network, network which, is, which is a kind of uh, a loose network, but also a, a hopefully an institutional one, which will uh, emerge as we go in the next four or five years to be much more uh, hopefully institutionalized, at least in the way we function. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and within this network, we have opportunities for creating spaces uh, for teaching and creating knowledge and also, and, um, and also having some exchange, student exchanges and um, faculty exchanges and opportunities for thinking together with one another across this Asia and Africa, uh, Europe and Central America, uh, um, and uh, North and um, uh, Latin America. So, uh, and how do we do this? How are we imagining this? We've already tried and experimented with this. Um, and we are saying that, yes, we have all these big uh, conceptual uh, issues that we have to decolonize ourselves from, but how do we do this? What, what is the way in which uh, in Humanities Across Borders we have imagined to do so? And uh, here is where we are saying that, firstly, we must recognize that when there is a collaboration, we also are also saying that the borders between uh, hard sciences and soft sciences, the borders between a wealthy university and a not so wealthy university, an encyclopedic established university and a, a not so, but some uh, more agile university. We must recognize that these that as well in, in, in when we collaborate across any kind of knowledge access or teaching and learning access. Um, with regard to the pedagogies, with, with regard to what we are calling a decolonial pedagogical model, um, what, we, what we would like to say here is that universities and the way we teach um, are, are actually institutions and um, uh, modes of learning and uh, transmitting knowledge are proactive players in the region's development, that is in the context of where they are located. And so in that respect, through this Humanities Across Borders program, we want to reclaim the local, we want to localize the knowledge, we want to have curricula that are situated um, not just within um, a, a kind of, uh, as, as you know, uh, my colleagues have already mentioned between area studies, Asian studies, Asia and uh, Africa and Asia studies, but also within the local, within where they are situated and have that conversation from there um, across uh, regions and both intra and uh, inter-regional. And so we are hoping that through this program in the next five years, we have, as Rohit also mentioned, an opportunity for creating a new generation of scholars who would be able to think and, 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 and think in a global context in a way that kind of normalizes the fact that there is um, uh, the, the fact of being in Asia and Africa axis or the fact of including in the curricula a Latin American country or uh, an African country or not just a country, and, and I like the idea of, you know, de-continental uh, and de-national way of teaching and learning. So uh, to be able to normalize this idea is what we have in mind uh, uh, when we talk about decolonial pedagogies. Um, I think uh, I don't want to say too much because I think we've already said a lot, but we have been, um, you know, we have done some work and some of the things that are entry points to conversations with each other in the last four years have been around very simple 
everyday uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas, say the idea of food, the idea of making, say craft and cultivation, the idea of language and words, um, um, and dwelling or place. So we have used these um, entry points or just, just simple ways of starting a conversation uh, around rice, for example, around indigo, for example. Um, which in one level, you, you, there are enough and more disciplinary uh, ideas around these, um, uh, these entry points. But at Humanities Across Borders, we are hoping and we have seen that there is a very productive um, uh, conversation that emerges when we bring together people from different um, uh, continents um, uh, and talking about the same thing and from a situated, contextualized knowledge perspective. And here I would like to quote one of my colleagues who's also here uh, in, in, this, in this meeting, Kojo, when, we, when he was talking to us about the kind of experiments he has done at his own institution uh, under the Humanities Across Borders program, uh, when he did a consultative workshops with local community elders in towns and villages outside Lagon. And he says here, I have during field stints encountered griot-like figures, migrants in Ghana, Togo, and Benin, who are regarded for their reflective philosophical knowledge as walking libraries with up-to-date knowledge and histories of their communities. They demonstrate illimitable possibilities for the formal educational establishment. They tell their stories from memory, extemporaneously, elaborating actions, events at length. These experiences challenge the conventional pedagogical paradigm and call for alternative frameworks. So um, yeah, with this, I'd like to just um, say that um, in Humanities Across Borders program at IAS, we are hoping that in the next five years, we have all of you um, uh, who, are, uh, who are here on this panel and more colleagues who are not, um, I have this open invitation to use this network and, and to be part of this experiment um, in, in developing new curricula, in having conversations outside of the box, outside, and to really uh, decolonize not just our knowledge, but also the pedagogies in which we teach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. So over to you. Thank you, Arti, for this uh, introduction to HAB. Uh, we don't have much time, but I wanted to ask uh, my colleague Paul Paul Van der Velde, who is the secretary of the ICAST network and who has been instrumental in, in providing the framework for the, uh, the, the two major conferences that we uh, help organize together with our colleagues from Ghana and, and, and Tanzania uh, 2015 and 2018. Uh, Paul. Yes. Ah. There I am. <laughs> Welcome, brothers and sisters. Uh, in our organizational approach of the Africa Asia New Access of Knowledge uh, conference or connection, we uh, use the well established uh, ICAS model and network, which uh, has a border transcending and multidisciplinary nature. This, in close cooperation with close with local partners executing the process. The first meeting uh, we organized uh, was, or the first meeting was organized by the University of Ghana uh, with Lloyd as the local host, as the local host, and more importantly, as the counter hegemonic partner and brother, as he said. This meeting uh, was attended by more than 300 uh, participants um, and was, in fact, a huge success. 350. Or 350, Philip is correcting me. 450. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we also, at that point in time, established the Africa Asia Book Prize, which, of, as of its third edition, will be organized by the African uh, Association for Asian Studies. Uh, the success of the first meeting um, yeah, brought in more uh, new partners um, from around the world, 
um, to co-organize and also to co-own the next meeting, which was in Dar es Salaam, organized by the University of Dar es Salaam, and uh, with, uh, uh, with Matthew Senga, who was in his car. Um, it's uh, typical, I, I mean, we have been to Dar es Salaam and there are some traffic jams, we must admit. Uh, he was the local host uh, for this meeting. Okay, this, um, this co-sponsorship uh, model uh, paves the way uh, for future uh, triennial meetings of the new Access uh, Conference. As ICAS secretary, it is my uh, yeah, it is my yeah, my hope to combine the Africa Asia New Access meeting uh, with ICAS in 2027 in Accra, when uh, Lloyd's Asian Studies Institute will have been uh, well uh, well established. Um, Rounding, this will round off a process which started in 2012 in Zambia and continued in Accra, Dar es Salaam, and hopefully in the next triennial meeting will be in Senegal, followed by South Africa, and then will end in Accra in 2027 as a combination of both things, as a combination of the, the ICAS meeting and the Africa-Asia meeting. Um, at that point, it will become a matter of turning the wheel of this immersive uh, process and it will be situated in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, reminding us of the, uh, I think, the, the, um, the critical importance of these uh, two events uh, that uh, were that followed in fact uh, a, a very important meeting in, in uh, Zambia in 2012 uh, hosted by our colleague from uh, University of Zambia uh, Professor Webi Kalikiti. I think now I would like to uh, suggest a 15 minutes break everybody needs a break and when we reconvene we will open the floor for discussion and I will ask two, uh, just to start, I will ask two uh, colleagues, our colleague Webby, to say a few words, uh, since he was very much the initiator of this process back from 2012, and, uh, and also our colleague from uh, Kyoto Sekai University, uh, uh, Dr. Kai Amo, uh, because they have also established an Africa Asia Center. So um, just this in 15 minutes. So see you in 15 minutes.